Hello. Thank you for having me. Uh, let me begin with my traditional apology. Uh, I am by nature a fast talker. I was once known as the scourge of the United Nations Simultaneous Translation Corps. I would speak in what I thought was a very slow and measured tone, and I'd turn around, and there would be a line of translator booths, and every one of them would be doing this. Uh, couple that with the fact that I have now consumed almost enough coffee to drop a rhino, and it is a near certainty that I will start speaking quickly. And when I do, I invite you to do this and slow me down. So I wanted to talk today about some of what I think of as the prehistory of the Pirate Party and the movement that I think it is a, a flagship bearer for. I wanted to talk specifically about 1999 and the launch of Napster. Uh, when Na Na Napster launched, it became, at the time, the fastest adopted technology in the history of the world and went from zero to 52 million users in 18 months. It was uh, shut down by a court in 2001. When it was shut down, it had 52 million users. One year before it was shut down, 50 million Americans voted for the Democrats and 50 million Americans voted for the Republicans. In other words, there were enough Napster users that if they represented a political party, they would have handily won the American election and quite possibly would have elected a better president than the one that the Supreme Court chose. But of course, that's not what Napster users did. If you want to understand what Napster's, Napster users did, just stop cleaning up your apartment for a few months. Walk into your kitchen and turn on the lights and watch all the cockroaches run under the cabinets. Because that's what Napster users did when they shut down Napster. We all felt like we'd been getting away with something naughty. And as soon as we were told that we'd been very naughty, most of us slunk away and said, I guess it was a good ride, but now it's over. Now, Napster was a remarkably industry-friendly technology, as these things go. Uh, you may remember, those of you who were around a decade ago, that they had some venture capital funding from one of Silicon Valley's blue-chip VCs. And my understanding is that those VCs walked into the various record industry's offices with a check and said, you just tell me how many zeros you want us to write on this check for us to uh, have a legitimate license to use your music, that's how many zeros we'll put on it. After all, Napster surveyed their users and found that more than half of them were willing to spend $15 a month to be a Napster user, which represented an ungodly sum of money for the music industry, potentially. Uh, $15 a month is a lot more than most people spend on music now, and a lot more than they spent on music then. Um, what's more, the structure of Napster gave them a natural point where they could have audited usage and said, of the $15 we've collected from our users, this much goes to this artist and that much to that, because we know exactly what's been downloaded. Now, the shutdown of Napster didn't end file sharing, but it did end the creation of architectures for file sharing that were friendly to industry. Each subsequent iteration of file sharing infrastructure became less centralized, less subject to audit, less um, able to uh, uh, exclude people who hadn't paid. Uh, over and over again, we saw the introduction of technologies, first Nutella, all the way up to trackerless torrents that are the kind of entertainment industry equivalent of antibiotic resistant bacteria, a superbug that they can't get rid of. Now, on the one hand, this is not new. Technology has, through history, created a series of innovations that made it hard to control individual uses of copyrighted works. The playing of a record on the radio, or the playing of, of recorded music in halls like this one through speakers in the ceiling, all of these made it hard to control the individual diffusion of works and hard to exclude people who hadn't paid from them to, uh, from listening to them and enjoying them. Um, now, the solution to that problem, 
over and over again has been grounded in one of the uh, most important American principles of commerce which, and ethics, which is um, money talks, bullshit walks, which is to say that as between the right to decide who gets to use your music and the right to be paid because people are using your music, getting paid is substantially more important for most people than uh, merely choosing. In fact, this, is, this goes all the way back to radio when legitimate artists, that was to say the artists that um, were popular on record, uh, which is to say white, uh, rich artists, not artists performing country music and not African-American artists, were represented by a rights society called ASCAP that wouldn't allow their music to be played on radio because they felt that radio was a pirate medium. And so, and so a new rights society was created, BMI, that represented poor artists who performed country and, country and Western music and uh, black artists, what were called race artists. And they were the only ones who got paid. And as a result, after a few years of this, all the so-called legitimate artists went to their rights societies and said, we don't care about our moral right to choose who listens to our music on the radio. We care about feeding our families. Screw our moral rights. Just get us paid. So when you step onto a stage at a karaoke bar, the barman doesn't figure out who Queen's manager is, where he lives, and call him up and say, someone is about to sing Bohemian Rhapsody. Do I owe them 25 cents or 30 cents? Instead, that barman, just like the manager of this venue and the manager of the airport and the manager of hotels and so on, pays a single fee that gets them the right to play any music they want, and that music is collected and then distributed to artists. Uh, now, that could be the way that ISPs do it. You could pay a few euros per customer, and for it, uh, the customers could get the right to download anything that they wanted in any format from anywhere and play it. Now, there are lots of ways that this could go terribly, terribly wrong. First, it could be mandatory for ISPs, which meant that instead of the labels and the collecting societies setting a fair price that represented the value that ISPs thought that they could get and not a fee that was so high that the enforcement costs would outstrip the cost of, of, uh, of uh, the, the value they would get from it. Instead, they could just name a very, very high price and then use the tax money that you and I pay to collect it because it would be mandatory and the ISPs would be required to do it by law. We need this to be voluntary. And after all, there are lots of ISPs that would love to be able to advertise. We're just like the ISP down the road, but our ISP comes with all the music ever recorded for free. Um, the collecting society could be corrupt. After all, most of them are. Um, they could be designed... They could be designed to um, only pay big labels or pay the labels disproportionately. A truly 21st century collecting society, on the other hand, could be built with the analytical intelligence of Google and the transparency of GNU Linux. Uh, the analytical methods used by the collecting society could be invasive. Instead of using statistical methods to figure out who was um, uh, listening to what and who to pay, they could spy on all of our network traffic to figure out what we were doing. But these are implementation details. They're not deal breakers. Advocating blanket licenses for online music for downloading would be a huge win for pirates and for copyright reformers in general. But to understand why, first we need to ask ourselves what copyright is for. Now, I'm of the opinion that copyright can be good and that we can have a good copyright system provided that it is confined to merely regulating the entertainment industry. After all, there's nothing wrong with the idea that industries should be regulated. We like the idea that we could have regulations that protect the public, like regulations against unfair lending practices in banks. We like the idea that we could have uh, regulations that protect members of the supply chain from abuse through the natural choke points. Now, um, many European nations have had this technical idea that the purpose of copyright was to regulate culture and to uh, protect artists. But if you look at the history of copyright, it has always been written with the entertainment industry's supply chain in mind and has always been run that way. Um, the problem is that it's metastasized. We used to have this test to determine whether or not you were in the entertainment industry, and it was whether you were making a copy. 
because people who made copies in the old days had record presses or printing presses or um, film labs. Today, we copy a million times before breakfast. We copy like we brush our teeth. Now, that doesn't mean that we're all suddenly a part of the entertainment industry. It means the entertainment industry needs to start uh, cabining in more closely who falls under its regulation. Now, um, if you were playing sim regulator and you wanted to establish uh, a good copyright system, one that made all of your sims very happy, how would you measure whether or not you were successful? I don't think you could do it by measuring the total amount of money that was earned under your system. After